A group of armed vigilantes approached a pair of voters dropping off their ballots at a ballot drop box in Arizona, surrounding them, harassing them, apprehending them, following them and filming them. At least that's what's alleged. Not sure I actually believe it because of the partisan divisions. But right now, Democratic organizations are filing a lawsuit to stop another organization from having individuals monitor ballot drop boxes. Arizona sheriff steps up security around ballot drop boxes amid reports of intimidation. And now the DOJ is involved and Merrick Garland has come out and said we will not allow voter intimidation. Civil war, my friends. Maybe, maybe not. I seem to think we're on that path. But there's a lot of variables that lie before us. And I don't know exactly how this plays out. But one step at a time, it seems we are inching ever closer. For those that are fans of my content, you're probably saying to yourself, wow, Tim, you called this. I did. I don't get everything right. I make a lot of predictions that don't pan out. That's a reality. This one, I'm sad to say I predicted, but it's, it's, it's obvious. This is what I said a while back, several months ago. You are going to see right-wing organizations start monitoring ballot drop boxes. Why? Because of 2,000 mules, because of Dinesh D'Souza. Not that I'm saying it's wrong. I'm saying people have serious concerns about ballot drop boxes, and rightly so, they'll go and watch them. Is there anything wrong with watching a ballot drop box? In my opinion, no. But the left won't take kindly to this. They'll claim it's voter intimidation. They'll claim it's racist. In fact, that's exactly what they're doing. So again, I hate to see that I predicted this too well. Now we're hearing the Democratic organization say it violates this law against the Klan or something like that. Voter intimidation. We're seeing a report from CNN. A woman confronts these individuals filming their faces and license plate. The police get involved. Where do we go from here? One thing I fear that could happen in the midterms, because it's a couple weeks out. These organizations that are monitoring polling locations aren't just going to stop. Stop at this. I mean, there's a lot of people who are going to monitor polling locations, period. I mean, active ones that are open. I don't know to what scale, to what extent. I mean, it's just so far two boxes, I guess. So maybe you know, I'm right that in, this happened, but not at the scale many people maybe assumed. What happens when left wing organizations like Antifa show up? What was the story we saw yesterday? An individual that was campaigning on behalf of Ron DeSantis and Marco Rubio was mercilessly beaten. He's going to need reconstructive surgery on his face, and he's suffering from internal bleeding. The left says he's a fascist. Maybe. I've seen the reports. But the violence is there. There are extremists that are going to begin fighting. So here's what I fear watching this story. That you end up with some right-wing groups outside of a polling location, monitoring it, worried about ballot harvesting. You get left-wing groups like Antifa who show up and fighting erupts. The fighting results in the polling location being forced to close down. The police move in, have to separate the groups, and nobody's getting in. Now, perhaps the police just push the two groups aside and they create a corridor for voters. Either way, at that point, there will be lawsuits questioning the validity of that polling location, throwing the whole state into turmoil. What happens there? I don't know. Many people may then claim that the vote is illegitimate because some people were barred. We then have Hillary Clinton coming out, saying that the Republicans are already pre preparing to steal the 2024 election. That is Hillary Clinton. That is a crackpot, insane thing to say. But they're gearing up to refuse to accept defeat. Now, Donald Trump, of course, refused to accept defeat, and they claimed all these crazy things about him. But they refused to accept defeat in 2016. It doesn't matter which side you're on. I am not here to argue on behalf of one side or the other. I'm not here to argue there is or isn't fraud. I'm here to point out that when two large factions expand and do not trust the process, the end result is the results of that process are immaterial to the ideology and beliefs of either group. When Donald Trump lost, they said fraud. When Hillary Clinton lost, they said fraud. I mean, and to be honest, they went a bit crazier with it, launching an investigation for years, claiming that Trump was secretly working for Russia. And here we are. The animosity is not decreasing, de-escalating. It's in fact getting worse. And now taking a look at 
the issues of abortion, I certainly think that could be a catalyst for a civil war. Why? As much as people may not truly understand, nor am I a historian, having been uh, reading a bit about the civil war, slavery was the principal issue of the first civil war, but it didn't really matter to most people. And that's the important factor. When one side says the slavery was about, uh, I'm sorry, the civil war was about slavery, and one side says the civil war was about states' rights, technically they're both right. Slavery, of course, was the principal catalyst and largest issue. But for the average person, they didn't really care. The union was fighting to preserve itself. The South was fighting to secede. What they fought for was particularly specific. Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, in fact, only abolished slavery in the states that were in rebellion, which I believe would have given three union states the right to maintain slavery. It was an effort to force them to, to come back into the fold. But let's talk about what this means for abortion. And let's talk about civil war. Before we get started, head over to TimCast.com, become a member. In order to support our work as a member, you'll get access to exclusive segments of the TimCast IRL podcast, uncensored, members only, Monday through Thursday. You can also watch our other shows like the Cast Castle Vlog, Tales from the Inverted World. And we've got new shows coming very soon and new members content. We're just going to keep trying to expand to become bigger and better and make content for you. Maybe in a few years, maybe in 10 years, we'll be able to grow big enough to actually compete with larger networks and create cultural content so that you can stop supporting companies that hate you. But we're trying. We'll see where we can go with it. We are aiming for the stars. Don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe to the channel, share the show with your friends. Let's jump into the first story from 1011 Now. K-O-L, uh, K-O-L-N, K-G-I-N, Arizona sheriff steps up security around ballot drop boxes amid reports of intimidation. A grain of sand in any potential civil war or conflict, but a grain of sand nonetheless. They report. The sheriff in Metropolitan Phoenix said Monday he stepped up security around ballot drop boxes after a series of incidents involving people keeping watch on the boxes and taking videos of voters as they were apparently inspired by lies about the 2020 election. Now, I'll pause there. This is also part of the escalation of the rhetoric. Following the 2020 election, there were a lot of crazy stories about Venezuelan servers and Chinese ballots and shootouts in Germany. Nonsense, in my opinion. Just wild theories. But then we ended up seeing a de-escalation in the extremity of the rhetoric, resulting in something a bit more tame. Dinesh D'Souza's 2,000 mules. Ballot harvesting. Well, that's not surprising at all. Much more within the realm of possibility, though there's no direct evidence other than what they presented in the documentary. And there are questions that should be asked. In a, in a, not every state bans ballot harvesting. But ultimately, the question is procedure and policy around elections, not about fraud. I think the issue many people need to be worried about is, are certain things allowed and are they not? Which is what Donald Trump and many of the Republicans were suing for in 2020. Now, this is what we're seeing. On Friday, deputies responded when two masked people carrying guns and wearing bulletproof vests showed up at a drop box at, in Mesa, a Phoenix suburb. The secretary of state said her office has received six cases of potential voter intimidation to the state attorney general and the U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, as well as a threatening email sent to the state's elections director. People watching the boxes and voters showing up to vote covered their license plates, according to photos shared on social media. Quote, every day I'm dedicating a considerable amount of resources just to give people confidence that they can cast a vote safely. And that is absurd. Maricopa County Sheriff Paul Penzone said during a news conference. Penzone said his office has referred two incidents to county prosecutors for potential criminal charges. Fueled by former President Donald Trump's false claims of fraud in 2020 and the debunked film 2000 Mules, drop boxes have become a hotbed for conspiracy theories, alleging without evidence that people illegally collected and deposited ballots in them. I will pause and say, watch out for claims like debunked. That's a media term. It doesn't mean anything. Typically, what you see when someone claims that something is debunked is an opinion piece, an opinion saying, you know, we disagree with their their assessment. AP News wrote in May 3rd, 2022, gaping holes in the claim of 2K ballot mules. By all means, that's fine to make your argument. It has not been adjudicated. I mean, it has not gone through law enforcement or the courts. And so what you have are media. It's the media arguing with itself. Now, I'm no fan of claims of fraud. You guys know me because I think it's voter suppression for the most part. And I think in order to solve it, 
you need the power to launch investigations and file for subpoenas. And over the past couple of years, we've seen very little fruit come of these attempts at investigations. What really matters to me is a, a procedure, policy procedure. Are ballot drop boxes constitutional? Is election month constitutional? Is universal mail-in voting constitutional? Those have not been properly legislated or adjudicated, and I think it, they need to be. But either way, I'm not here to argue for any of that. I'm simply here to point out that two factions are in, uh, escalating the rhetoric. Now, I want to point something out. The sheriff in the Metro Phoenix area stepping up security. Do you think that is good or bad? In terms of escalation towards, towards civil war, it's bad. The left and Democrats are going to claim that police presence at drop boxes is voter intimidation. They will say the police are now aiding the right and everyone knows cops are right wing. Well, there you have it. A couple of guys outside of a, a, a ballot box and the police comments are watching those boxes. Mission accomplished for the right, I suppose. The left will claim the police are racist and it's voter intimidation. But outside of that, we have this story from CNN. Woman confronts armed man near ballot drop box. Why is this news? I don't know. I don't know why CNN cares. It was two people pointing cameras at each other and CNN gave this woman a prime time spot. This will lead to escalation. And Merrick Garland is stepping in, saying the DOJ has an obligation it will not allow voters to be intimidated. A threat to any election official, worker, or volunteer is at bottom a threat to democracy. We are not a democracy. That is not a left or right wing statement. We are a constitutional republic with democratically elected representatives. So I'm wary of anyone saying a threat to our democracy. We are not a country that is controlled by a popular vote. Merrick Garland is stepping up because of what we are seeing. In response from Democracy Docket, we can see the Arizona Alliance for Retired Americans and Voto Latino filed a lawsuit against Clean Elections USA, its affiliates and unidentified individuals who allegedly have been recruited or encouraged by Clean Elections USA to monitor drop boxes, challenging the organization's voter intimidation practices in Arizona. The plaintiffs allege that there were at least five instances last week wherein Clean Elections USA supporters gathered at, dro at ballot drop boxes in Maricopa County with the express purpose of deterring voters. The plaintiffs argue that Clean Elections USA alleged coordinated campaign of vigilante voter intimidation. Practices violate both the Voting Rights Act and the Klan Act of 1871. The plaintiffs request immediate relief preventing Clean Elections USA from further engaging in intimidation practices as Arizonans have begun early voting and there are only 15 days until Election Day. I hope it just ends here. I can't see the future. I can make a prediction. My prediction is I see no reason why this would de-escalate. Uh, if you do, please comment below. Just because a lawsuit was filed will not prevent individuals from deciding to go out and make sure there's no ballot harvesting. And I got to be honest, there's no argument against it. The idea that some dude sitting next to his car is voter intimidation is insane. Well, you think that because someone else is sitting somewhere, you're, they're stopping you from voting? They don't know who you're voting for. Ridiculous. And you can argue that anyone who would be intimidated by these men could vote in either direction, which is why I don't trust the Democrat lawsuits. And I'm very suspect as to what's going on. From Politico, the Biden administration is set to warn about threats to nation's election infrastructure. Well, that's strange. What do you mean? We heard two years ago we had the most secure election ever. What changed? Something is breaking down. From Politico, top Biden national security officials are tracking multiple threats to the nation's election security infrastructure ahead of the midterms and are set to issue warnings, including in an internal intelligence bulletin this week, according to two people familiar with the matter. So let me just pause and say this. You mean to tell me 2016, our election was attacked. 2020, everything was a OK. 2020, we're now in trouble again. What's going on here? Are they unable to actually maintain any kind of security? It's very, very strange. It's almost like when Republicans win, there's a problem. When Democrats win, there's no problem. And right now, the Democrats are predicting a Republican win. All of a sudden, there's a problem again. Tell me how this does not escalate. It's psychotic. Oh, here's the next step. Hillary Clinton claims right-wing extremists 
already planning to literally steal the 2024 election. Ladies already claiming the 2024 election is being stolen. It's two years away. Incredible. MAGA has a plan to steal the election in 2024. We have to stop them. Reads the PAC's homepage. In conjunction with the Political Action Committee Indivisible, Clinton suggested the 2024 presidential election is in danger, saying, I'm here to highlight something. The former Secretary of State chuckled, that is keeping me up at night. Right-wing extremists already have a plan to literally steal the election. Amazing. Hillary Clinton's lost the plot. She said, and they're not making a secret of it. The right-wing Supreme Court may be poised to rule on giving state legislatures the power to overturn presidential elections. Just think that. Just think, if that happens, the 2024 presidential election could be decided not by the popular vote or even that, that anachronistic electoral college, but by state legislatures, many of them Republican controlled. Full stop. What? You mean to tell me that when people vote at the local level, it influences federal level politics? That's how it's always been. And that was the intended condition. The Constitution actually says the state legislatures determine. The point is, federal elections are state matters. When it comes to Congress, your district votes for an individual in your state to go represent you. When it comes to the Senate, the initial system pre the 17th Amendment was that state legislatures would appoint a senator. And the way the president worked is that the state legislature would determine which electoral uh, uh, voters would go to uh, to vote, who uh, would, would determine who would vote for the president. It was very much intended to be. You voted for your state rep and your state senator. They then moved forward with federal matters. And it makes a lot of sense to operate that way. I actually agree with it. Since we've moved to a more federalized system, you end up with inane policy positions and incorrect ones, ignorant ones, where a, con- a Congress Uh, An individual running for Congress will say, I'm going to clean up our town. Vote for me. And I'm just like, bro, you go and vote at the federal level. You're not cleaning up anything. It's amazing to me that you actually have people who are like, send me to D.C. and I'll clean up Dubuque. It's like, what? Bro, you're going to D.C. to vote on war and federal budgets, not on what happens here in our locality. That's a state level vote. Now, Someone wants to run and say, I'm going to vote against war. Vote for me, send me to D.C. I'll say no war. We've really lost sight of how this system is supposed to work. What Hillary Clinton is pointing out is not a plan to steal the election. She's pointing out that the Supreme Court might actually rule the Constitution is supposed to operate the way the Constitution is supposed to operate. This is the breakdown of the system. The Bulwark wrote this story, September 20th. I've highlighted it before. And I want to read for, uh, read for you some of it again as it pertains to what we're seeing now in Arizona. I'm not a big fan of the bulwark. I think they're kind of crazy, and I don't know who they represent. But they write some interesting things. How the second civil war could start. The, the potential U.S. descent into violence, mutual suspicion, and even dissolution. Do you know what they'll say in 100 years if there's a civil war? They'll say the issue was abortion. They will say the issue was abortion. And you must be thinking to yourself right now, that's not, no, abortion's not that big of an issue. During the first civil war, neither was slavery. Now, when the South, the South seceded, it was principally because of slavery. If slavery was, if there was no slavery, there would have not have been a civil war. Why did they fight? Arguably, if you want to argue at the macro level, slavery was the principal issue. But if you get down to the motivations of why anyone fought, then it was states' rights. And then the left says, a state's right to what? And many historians do, not really left, left or right, but uh, historians will say a state's right to what? And exactly, yes, slavery. In fact, the, in, in the Confederate Constitution, they enshrined slavery. Statements from the vice president were overtly white supremacist and racist. But on an individual level, why did someone feel fervent about actually fighting for the Confederacy or the Union? <clears throat> Excuse me. Union soldiers fought not for or against slavery, but to preserve the union. And the South fought to secede. They called them rebels. There, were, there was a reason why the fighting began, but the fighting was principally about preserving or dissolving the union. I shouldn't say dissolving. The South wanted to secede. That was about it. Interesting, I, interesting thing I learned was that only about 5% of the country actually owned slaves. And there were a lot of slaves, mind you. But most people in the South did not care for this issue because most were just poor farmers. But they fought because their states opted for secession 
and the North invaded. That's about it. The South called it the war for Northern aggression. The, uh, the North called them rebels. They said it was an internal matter. <clears throat> people today look back on this and say slavery was the reason. You read the history and you'll find that many of the people on either side didn't care. And I'll stress this point. The Emancipation Proclamation was signed by Abraham Lincoln. There was a precursor to it, September of 1862, January of 1861, I believe January 1st. He issues it and it only abolished slavery in states in rebellion. I believe there were three states, Maryland being one of them, that I think Missouri and maybe Kentucky, I'm not sure. They were slave states, but they were not in rebellion. It would have preserved slavery. Let's read about how the Second Civil War could start. The Bulwark writes, during the 2022 campaign, National Democrats were bracing for a tidal wave that might eject them from the House and the Senate. They go on to mention Donald Trump as a candidate, blah, 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 blah. They go on to say this. In such an environment, many were worried about armed poll watchers, inflamed passions, and even possible violence. Full stop. What did we just see? This article was written by the Bulwark on September 20th. We are now seeing armed poll watchers, albeit a few. Hopefully we don't see more. What am I going to say? You're allowed to be armed. You're allowed to watch ballot boxes. The reason I say hopefully we don't see more, what I mean is hopefully we don't see more escalation. If people want to sit and watch ballot boxes, I really don't care. I see nothing wrong with it. Inflamed passions, even violence in Texas. Voters saw unusually long lines in voting precincts in urban areas like Houston, Austin, San Antonio, and Dallas. They're going to say about this time, Democrats in Washington began wondering aloud if midterm election results could or should be believed, as they're doing now. Imagine a polling station in Texas on election day. The location doesn't matter. Neither does the underlying dispute. What matters is a person came to the polls purportedly on the hunt for voter fraud. States like Texas had given poll watchers more latitude to move around polling places, question procedures and exercise authority. This person, in accordance with Texas law, was armed with a semi-automatic pistol. I mean, that basically means any modern pistol, mind you. I don't know if anyone's got... Uh, I, technically, revolvers are semi-automatic. So I'm like, I don't know what kind of pistol you'd have that would fight a, a single action revolver, I guess. A discussion escalated, you know, 1860, 1870s style weapon. A discuss, or is that, what is that, like 1880s? Even? A discussion escalated into a confrontation, perhaps about the proper place to stand inside the polling precinct in relation to others, or about how to properly mark the ballot and use the ballot scanning machine. Things spun out of control. The person feared fraud was afoot and meant to stop it by any means necessary. It first came through a raised voice, then physical intervention, and ultimately through the brandished weapon. Tension and shouts ensued, followed by a scuffle. One shot rang out and a poll worker lay bleeding on the floor of the gymnasium. The polling place was a high school. As the blood pooled, the victim passed away. Simultaneously, a friend of the victim hit send on a video taken of the conflict of its horrible aftermath. The video, as these things do, flew faster than news coverage and became a national sensation. Raw emotions frayed further. I'll push back a little bit. Brandishing it up in a, in a high school ain't never going to happen. I don't know about Texas. I believe they've, they've recently passed constitutional carry, did they? It's been a while since I've, I've looked at this. But I don't know if you can have a gun in a high school. Maybe you can. Constitutional carry, I suppose. But let's not say high school. That's pointless. Let's just entertain a, a more plausible reality. A, a poll watcher scared of fraud. Being, uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, a, a, a poll observer shooting a poll worker. That's a leftist framing. Let me give you the more neutral framing. Actually, let me give you a more right wing framing. Antifa claiming that poll observers who are unarmed are white supremacists show up and begin mercilessly beating people, claiming that they're Trump supporters and fascists who need to be stopped and they're intimidating people. A fight breaks out. The polling location shuts down. Let me give you a more neutral perspective. Right wing groups that are armed are outside of these polling locations watching. Left wing groups then show up and claim these armed individuals are intimidating voters, particularly minorities. A scuffle breaks out. A fight ensues. Someone gets shot. The polling location is shut down for that reason, and the votes can't be processed. The police show up. A murder investigation ensues. Or how about this? Someone shoots a gun. That's it. Nobody gets shot. Nobody gets hurt. That's it. What happens? Let's get, let me give you this scenario. A polling location anywhere. Swing state. People are lining up to vote. There's protesters, and then a gunshot rings out. Everyone runs away. Nobody votes. People panic. The police are called in to investigate. What's going on? Search for suspects. The polling location is shut down. Individuals can't vote. What do we do then? 
Does the state then postpone the election due to dire circumstances? Does the state just simply say, I'm sorry, but anybody who is going to vote in this area, your vote no longer counts? Well, that's going to result in lawsuits, appeals, and say the count can't go move forward. Now, let's say in this district there were 10,000 votes to be processed and the vote is within 10,000. That's it. Shut down. There will be an argument from either side saying we can't know the results because these people couldn't vote. I don't know. I really don't know. I hope not. But I really, you know, after 2020, after the 529 insurrection, you think we're not going to see the far left going insane, especially now that we're already getting reports that armed men are outside polling locations, outside of ballot boxes. How long until Antifa shows up to these places and starts fighting these guys? How long until that sparks someone getting shot? And then they say just that we can't trust the result because after this shooting, people were too scared to go vote. How will we know? It's going to result in pandemonium. I love this one. The Bulwark writes, Carrie Lake's perfect answer on abortion. They put it in quotes. I don't understand why the Bulwark claims to be conservative, but is pro-choice. It's just the weirdest thing. I don't claim to be conservative, and I am pro-choice, traditionally traditionally pro-choice. And I'm just confused by what that Bulwark is supposed to be. But sure. Here's the map. Center for Reproductive Rights shows us the hostile and illegal states. Let's operate on just the illegal states. And you're seeing the South, the South, plus you've got looks, I believe, South Dakota and Idaho. And they have made it illegal to get abortions. So this website says it's illegal. Hostile states make it very, very difficult. And you can see we now have a state's rights issue. Whoever wins the 2024 election, they'll be the union, as it were. Here's my prediction which very, very well may be wrong because I give it only a small probability, but I see it as a potential path we may be walking towards. Abortion is made illegal. 2024, I'll give you a couple scenarios. The simple, the, the simple scenario that I've predicted is Republicans have already, Lindsey Graham's already said he wants a national abortion. Chuck Grassley said, uh, I'm sorry, a national abortion ban. Chuck Grassley says no. Republicans win. When they do win the House and the Senate, they then start advocating for the right to ban abortion in all of these states. And it escalates to a national level. Now, many have said the Republicans won't move for this, but I believe the only reason they're rejecting it now is because it's, it's pre midterm and they're scared. Talk to any pro-lifer. They're outright saying they want abortion banned at the national level, the federal level. My prediction. Come 2024, with Joe Biden in office, Republicans are unable to pass sweeping abortion reform. They want abolition. Violence is erupting between states, bleeding Kansas level chaos. Maybe not to the extreme degree, but John Brown type stuff. Maybe. I mean, we've already seen extremism with the left. You then get a Donald Trump who says, if you vote for me, I will sign the abortion ban on day one. Democrats panic, but it's not a major issue. The economy is. And so what ends up happening is that while abolition is a big issue for Republicans, as it was in 18, 18, I believe it was 1860, you end up with Democrats. They care, but too many people think the economy is more important. Trump wins. You then get a sweeping abortion ban and Democrat states rejecting the law, refusing federal authority. And then you get a breakdown. But there's a better solution. There's a better, uh, I should, I, not, not a better solution. There is, a, uh, there is a, a worse scenario, probably a better way to put it. Hillary Clinton is maybe right. Supreme Court rules state legislatures decide who the president is. Not a popular vote, not a statewide vote, the state legislatures. It just so happens that for the longest time, they've determined a popular vote in their state is the way to do it. 2024 comes around. Questions of fraud erupt in key states. Interestingly, Hillary Clinton's PAC highlights the six states where Republicans are claiming fraud took place. Interesting. Well, the state legislatures there are Republican. So what do they say? Citing the evidence and claims in 2024, we are determining that the votes should go to Donald Trump. And then you end up with the first election, technically, where there's no popular vote winner, where I'm sorry, where the popular vote winner and electoral college vote uh, uh, presumed winner actually loses. What happens is the states say the electoral college votes are determined by us. And so we award them to Donald Trump. 
Donald Trump then wins without the popular vote in the state or the federal level. Democrats at that point absolutely will try to secede once again. Oh, don't come at me with that party switch stuff. Here we are with Republicans once again being on the side of abolition, the defense of human rights and the Democrats on the side of rejecting federal law. They say the Supreme Court is illegitimate. Hey, the Democrats said that same thing. Funny how that works. Democrats back in the first civil war. This is where I think we're heading. And I could be wrong about all of that. Why? Well, come on. Here's how predictions work. What lies before us is an ever decreasing amount of variables. When you look further and further ahead, the amount of variables, the potentiality of variables increases exponentially. And the likelihood of you predicting the proper path or the probable path is diminished. If I'm standing in front of a window and I have a rock in my hand and someone says, what'll, asks, what will happen if you throw the rock? I can say there's a very strong possibility the window breaks, depending on the strength of the throw, depending on the kind of window. But let's say it's a regular old pane glass, you know, single pane glass house or whatever. Yeah, rock's probably going to break it. Now, let's go back in time. Let's go back one whole day and say, what will happen tomorrow afternoon at 3 p.m. as John keeps complaining about that ugly window? Well, a lot of things could happen. We could go out for pizza. We could go to the movies or we could stay at the house and stare at it. John could get increasingly angry, hand me a rock and then say, smash it. There's too many variables in between. I see this path. It's a possible path, but there's no guarantee we stay on the path that leads towards it. And I hope that's the case. Unfortunately for us, we walk down the path where there's now armed men outside of ballot boxes, outside of ballot drop box locations. I can only imagine the far left is going to respond. They're filing lawsuits for now, but a woman already went and confronted this guy. How long until Antifa shows up? Then you get a fight. Then right wing groups respond. And what happens when you get a Portland style clash at polling locations? Let us pray that does not happen. But I don't have a solution for you. Because if it's true, what people think about 2000 mules, well, then people on the right are going to show up no matter what. And either way, the left will show up because they're going to accuse the right of being, you know, fascist trying to vote or intimidate. I feel like it's a strong probability. Here is the latest array of opinion. The New York Times. Is America headed for another civil war October 12th? From the Gazette, is another American Civil War possible from October 24th? Here's one from Time Magazine. The U.S. is heading toward a second Civil War. Here's how we avoid it. I will give you one last little beacon of hope. Several former Charlie Crist colleagues have endorsed Ron DeSantis. Several Democrats have come out and endorsed Ron DeSantis. It's possible that the Democrats are losing steam to an extreme degree. So maybe... Maybe the Republicans just win and the Democrats lose. But I'll tell you something, my friends. I could be getting these numbers wrong because I'm not a historian, but I believe the North had around 20 million residents. The South had 9 million and 5 million were slaves. It was a minority fighting for the South. Let's say the Democrats end up losing across the board and maintain only about 25 to 30 percent of the population. Then they try to secede. And then you get civil war. One thing people don't understand about civil war, they say it's not going to be the same because you won't have state on state. They really just, I, I, you know, look, I am not an expert on this. And there's a lot I didn't know about even a week ago. But learning even as little as I have really changed my perspective on a lot of this. I believe it was Robert E. Lee from Virginia, who was a U.S. military man. And he said, it's a question of raising my arms against my home state or my home country. And I could not envision raising my weapon against Virginia. People just don't get it. They're like, no one cares about their state. But you care about your neighbors? No, no one cares about their neighbors. Will you be the one pointing the gun at them, telling them to get back in their homes because you're the boss now? See, those people don't get. Someone may be from California. They're in the National Guard. They're the police. And the federal government says, we need to stop the rebellion. So they dispatch National Guard and federal troops to stop what's happening in California. Someone said to me the other day, Tim, the feds aren't going to use the California National Guard to stop a California rebellion. I know that. That's not the point I'm making. The point I'm making is that it will be the army, the Insurrection Act. 
you're from California. You enlist or you seek a commission. You're a CEO, 24 years old. You're getting training. A bunch of your friends are enlisted and a bunch of people you know, you know, you know people, you have friends, you work with them, you're in the army. California threatens to secede. The California National Guard, they're not going to side with the federal government. Of course, they operate under the direction of their governor. The U.S. invokes the Insurrection Act and seeks to deploy the army against California. Several of the high ranking officers say, do I raise my arms against my own family, my friends? And they say no, and they defect. And then you end up with Democrats 2.0 fighting a civil war. The one question that people need to ask themselves as well, who is China going to fund and who will Russia fund? It's going to be really interesting, isn't it? Let me slow down. I hope we don't get to that point. From where we are now to where we get there is a long path out of us. And I hope, I hope we just kind of wind things down. Unfortunately, I'll say it again, as I have many times, although it could just end here and everything calms down and, and there's no escalation. And I would appreciate that. I don't see any reason why things would de-escalate. Do you? No one's ever given me an answer. No one's ever given me an answer as to how things de-escalate. We can only see the probabilities of escalation because our cultures have bifurcated. Well, there you go. I'll leave it there. Next segment's coming up at 8 p.m. over at youtube.com slash timcastirl. Thanks for hanging out, and I'll see you all then.